Can you hear me now? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you before. Somebody. Yes. Yes. Good no. morning. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. A little, little technical snafu there. Okay. All right. Uh, today, I thought what we would do is review our first intracardiac study and uh, we'll go over it. So, this is a 13 uh, year old with a history of recurrent SVT. Heart rates uh, have been recorded between 180 and 200. And uh, the patient actually has an Apple Watch and was able to make this tracing, which uh, I think you can see is a probably a narrow QRS heart rate of about 180 beats per minute. So this was a nice example of somebody using new technology to document SVT. Okay. So uh, the options for this patient were uh, no therapy, medical therapy, or ablation. And so, you know, we remember that in general for patients with structurally normal hearts, SVT is not a life-threatening condition. So, uh, and there are patients who have very rare episodes. And so we always do offer the option of no therapy. There are people who will have one episode every three or four years. They can break it with a Valsalva. They say, they'll tell you they'd rather not have an ablation. But uh, most of the time, by the time they see us, the issue has been an, a bigger issue for a while. Uh, medical therapy, as you know, carries the uh, benefits of not assuming any risk of catheterization. Most of the time we can find a medical therapy that is effective, but as you know, there is no uh, once you're on therapy, you're on chronic therapy, there is no medication that uh, cures you of SVT. And generally the fact that patients need to be chronically on medical therapy is usually a reason that patients opt to go, to not stay with medical therapy when they're old enough for an ablation. And obviously the major benefit of ablation is the potential for cure. And in most studies, as you know, the success rate for transcatheter ablation of SVT in a structurally normal heart is above 90%. And so this family chose ablation. Okay, so we're just gonna sort of go through how it is that we discovered or decided that this patient had the type of SVT that they have so that you understand the, mech, the way we do this. And you know, in general, uh, an EP study prior to ablation is sort of like a little puzzle and we're trying to gather evidence to convince ourselves of a diagnosis before we start um, burning in some, inside somebody's heart. So the first thing that I always look at and we always look at is the baseline electrocardiogram. That's important because we're about to put catheters in the heart. We're gonna be putting catheters near the conduction system, uh, the AV node and the bundle of Hiss. And uh, there's always a possibility that there'll be trauma related to the catheterization. So you always sort of wanna know what you're starting with. So I'll always print out a 12 lead ECG and uh, look at it. And some of the things that we're most concerned about is uh, we want to measure the PR interval, of course, because a lot of times we are uh, doing things around the His bundle or the AV node, and we want to know what we started with so that if we don't leave the lab with this type of PR interval, we at least uh, you know, know that it's an important difference. <laughs> And so then we put our catheters in. And the first thing that we do is we get uh, what are generally referred to as baseline intracardiac intervals. So, so that everybody understands when you're looking at this type of a tracing an EP, during an EP study, first of all, the sweep speed is very fast. It's at 100 millimeters per second. So that you understand and remind you that a regular standard ECG is one fourth uh, the speed, it's at 25 millimeters per second. <clears throat> and so that's why the QRS and all the intervals seem a lot longer. And this is important because it's the only way we can accurately measure things in milliseconds on the computer. And when you're looking at these tracings, <clears throat> it's fairly standard to put a number of surface electrocardiograms at the top of the tracing. And then the rest of the tracings are typically intracardiac tracings. And you always want to look on the left-hand side of the screen at the legends so that you know what channel is what. And so every single electrophysiologist does it differently, even uh, between Dr. Love and myself, we do it differently, although they're fairly similar. Um, and so 
when you're looking at these types of tracings, the first thing you have to do is familiarize yourself with what are these channels. Some laboratories will uh, color code them. That's what Barry and I do. Some laboratories prefer everything to be in white, but I think it's just easier visually when things are different colors. And so um, we start off, we have a catheter that's sitting in the high right atrium, typically in the right atrial appendage. And this catheter is often used to both uh, pace the atrium as well as record uh, impulses in the right atrium. Uh, and so you see here, it's always a good idea if you're not sure what, what you're looking at in terms of atrial or ventricular electrogram, you wanna look at the surface electrocardiogram above it. Because remember that all the channels are simultaneous and occurring at exactly the same time. So we look here, we all recognize the P wave in lead one. So when we come down, we know that the P wave should be consistent or at a similar time as the atrial depolarization. And in fact, we see that in an, when the catheter is sitting in the high right atrium, the atrial depolarization actually precedes the onset of the P wave, probably because the catheter is sitting very, very close to the sinus node. Um, and then we see um, there are three channels in this particular case for the hiss. There's a distal hiss, a mid hiss, and a proximal hiss. So in our laboratory, we tend to use a quadrupolar catheter, which means there's four electrodes. And so the distal pair is measuring from the most distal electrode to the second most electrode, the mid pair from the second to the third, and the proximal from the third to the fourth. Some people will put a uh, hexapolar catheter so that they can have more electrodes. Uh, some people think that you should have like five to seven measurements of the Hiss, but I think it would be fair to say that most laboratories will typically display three channels of the Hiss. In this particular case, um, it's quite clear that the mid Hiss channel has the very nicest recording of the Hiss. And so we have the atrial electrogram, which is, you notice that it's starting a little later than the high right atrium because in sinus rhythm, the impulse starts from the high right atrium and works its way down the atrium. And the Hiss catheter is sitting across the tricuspid annulus in the anterior septal region. And that is a, a little bit of a distance from the high right atrium and therefore it takes uh, some time before the atrium depolarizes in that location where the catheter is sitting. Then we have um, the coronary sinus pairs. And uh, in this particular example, there are five pairs of electrodes. So the catheter is a so-called decapolar catheter, meaning it has 10 electrodes and we're recording between uh, in the distal pair. So we're going from the proximal near the mouth of the coronary sinus, progressively more distal until we're at the distal coronary sinus. Now, uh, it just happens that in our laboratory, the convention is that we display the proximal coronary sinus uh, at the top and we move farther and farther lateral and down the page to the distal CS but some laboratories will display it in the exact opposite uh, direction. Um, it's interesting that we, Barry and I both display the distal to proximal hiss from top to bottom, and yet we both display this coronary sinus in reverse. And that's just a, uh, just a convention that both of us have probably, as I often say, you are a victim of your training. That is probably how we remember being, it being displayed when we were in, in fellowship. Um, and so the coronary sinus, you remember, is a vein that runs behind the mitral annulus. And um, some people have said that it is God's gift to the electrophysiologist because by allowing us to place a catheter that sits behind the mitral annulus, <clears throat> we can record electrical impulses around the annulus, meaning we can record impulses on the left side of the heart without actually entering the left side of the heart. And so we see here that uh, the proximal coronary sinus, which is physically farther from the sinus node, the atrial depolarization is later than the Hiss and later even more from, than the high right atrium because it is physically farther from the sinus node than is the uh, high right atrium. And in fact, if you were to draw a line in your mind's eye from the, high, from the, the atrial depolarization in the proximal uh, CS, you would see that it's actually even after the P wave. Um, and as we get farther and farther lateral, you notice that 
each atrial electrogram is a little bit later than the next because we are physically farther and farther and farther away from the sinus node until we're finally in the left lateral position of the mitral annulus. And um, then we see here the ventricular electrogram. So in the, in the example of the HIST, there's a very large ventricular electrogram that is simultaneous with the QRS. Again, anything that's simultaneous with the QRS, you can pretty much count on as usually being representative of a ventricular electrogram. And we see here that there is a ventricular electrogram in every coronary sinus pair. Now, it's interesting to note that these two ventricular electrograms, I think you would agree they appear to be a little earlier than the proximal uh, ones, which is a little unusual, right? Because we should be depolarizing the ventricle earlier the closer we are to the Hiss. But this coronary sinus catheter was so far out the coronary sinus that it was wrapping around the mitral annulus and the distal and second to most distal pairs were actually closer to the Hiss than the proximal CS. And that's why these pairs are starting to come in a little bit earlier. And then finally, we have a catheter that's sitting in the right ventricle usually in the apex, and you can see this is the electrical uh, signal that we're recording here. So, and then the last catheter is the ablation catheter, which in our lab is denoted as the MAP catheter. There's a distal and proximal pair, so it's a quadrupolar catheter with two, electro, two pairs of electrodes. And because at this point in the case, we are not doing any ablation or mapping, it's just basically sitting in the heart, and you see there's actually no, impulse, no electrical activity at all on it. That's because it's probably sitting in the inferior vena cava waiting until we understand better what we're doing. Okay, so those are the uh, standard catheters. Again, it's a ablation catheter, a high right atrium, a his catheter, a coronary sinus catheter, and a right ventricular apical catheter. Probably the only main difference between Barry and I is that Dr. Dr. Love typically uses an octopolar catheter. So instead of having five pairs of electrodes, he'll have four doesn't really make a big difference. And he does this uh, with a catheter that's placed from the groin, which is a deflectible catheter that can be inserted into the coronary sinus. I typically will use a catheter from the right IJ coming down. And so the first thing that we do, uh, other than measuring the PR, is we measure the A to H interval. And the A to H interval is a surrogate for AV nodal conduction. Uh, it's interesting to note that we cannot, you're, I, at no point, this is the Hiss signal right here. So you have an atrial electrogram in the Hiss, a Hiss bundle electrogram, and then a V electrogram. But you notice that there is no AV node electrogram. And that's because it is not easily possible to record AV nodal conduction. However, we know that if you are conducting from the atrium in the Hiss to the bundle of Hiss, by definition, the length of time it takes to go from the A to the Hiss represents conduction through the AV node. And so the A to H interval is a very important baseline interval that we will be measuring in every case because we want to know that the AV conduction is normal uh, at the start of the procedure. And what we see here is that the AH is 71, and we know that a normal AH interval is anywhere between uh, 50 and 120. And then uh, we measure an HV interval from the Hiss to the earliest ventricular electrogram in any lead. And we see in this particular case, it's 48 milliseconds. That is also a normal HV interval. We know that a normal HV interval is between 35 and 50 milliseconds. So we're starting the procedure with normal AV conduction. So every electrophysiologist conducts their case slightly differently, but uh, the, I think that the key is to always try to do the cases in a logical and reproducible manner. And I usually do it the same way each time, just so that I don't forget to do anything. And so what I normally do and what most electrophysiologists do to start is we start with rapid atrial pacing. So we're rapid atrial pacing at a cycle length of 590 milliseconds. And you'll remember that the um, uh, cycle length, in order to get the heart rate, we would divide it into 60,000. So we're pacing at a rate a little above 100 beats per minute. And you can see here the little, the little uh, artifact on the high rate atrium from pacing. And in our computer, every time we're pacing, there'll be a little marker in the stimulation channel, which is helpful as well. So we're pacing at 590, and you can see that the intervals look relatively similar. And so here we are measuring the AV 
H interval when we're pacing at 590. And we notice that it's a little longer. If you remember at the baseline, when we were at a heart rate of like uh, 70, the AH interval was 71. Now we're pacing at 590 and the AH interval is a little longer at 82 milliseconds. And that's a demonstration of one of the most important concepts of the AV node, which is that of decremental AV conduction, meaning that as the impulse gets faster and faster, the AV node will conduct a little slower. So here we are at cycling 590, and there's a slight AH prolongation to 82 milliseconds. Now we're pacing at cycle length 500, uh, which is uh, 120 beats per minute, and we see now that the AH interval is lengthened a little bit more. It's now 90 milliseconds. Again, this is a normal finding in patients with normal AV nodal conduction. Now we're getting even a little faster. We're at about 400 cycle length 450, and we see that the A to H interval is lengthening even more. Uh, so whereas at uh, cycle length 500, we had an AH of 90 milliseconds, now at cycle length 450, the AH interval is lengthening even more to 108 milliseconds. And then when we get down to cycle length 400, we see something that is uh, a very interesting observation. And what I'm measuring here is the stimulation in the high red atrium. So this is the stimulation uh, uh, artifact from the, so it's from the stimulation and it's conducting all the way to this ventricle, ventricle uh, QRS, this QRS. Uh, we know that this stimulation is not conducting to this QRS because Physiologically, it's impossible to conduct in five milliseconds from the, through the AV node to the uh, HIS and the Purkinje system. So in this example, what we see, this, this 421 milliseconds is the time it takes to go from the stimulation to the next QRS. But the R to R interval is actually uh, shorter than the PR interval. And so, what we see here is that the PR interval, which is 420 milliseconds or almost, this is sort of like the PR interval, is greater than the R to R interval. And there is a name for that. We call that sustained slow pathway conduction. So when the PR interval during rapid atrial pacing becomes longer than the R to R interval, we call that sustained slow pathway conduction and that is another way to demonstrate the presence of dual AV nodal physiology, meaning that there is a slow pathway and a fast pathway within the AV node. Now, I would remind you that a lot of normal people have dual AV node physiology. Um, however, this is a piece of evidence that we're going to keep in our pocket as we're trying to figure out what it is that this is the cause of this particular patient's SVT. And then interestingly, in this patient, uh, when we got to, to 400, we got this rhythm, which was transient. So I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask uh, Sergey, what do you think this rhythm is that we're looking at? Good morning. Hey, Sergey. Um, this looks like. atrial fibrillation maybe although yes. yeah that's right you're absolutely right. um so what we're and how do we know that because we're seeing this very disorganized irregular rhythm in the coronary sinus pairs and what's interesting is um it's sort of interesting it almost looks like in the in the right atrium we are in uh atrial flutter because the uh P to P interval seems reasonably fixed, although it really is not. We took out calipers. And in the left atrium, we're in an even more disorganized rhythm. So it's interesting that the left and the right atrium are actually doing different things, um, but it's clearly some kind of an AFib type of a rhythm. Um, just an interesting observation that we saw this a number of times in the rapid atrial case this patient, even though there's no history of uh, AFib. Okay, so just again to remind everybody, in this example, the PR interval, uh, which is uh, 393 milliseconds, is greater than the R to R interval. Uh, 
and that is again an example of sustained slow pathway conduction. Uh, that's how we would refer to that. And that is uh, consistent with the diagnosis of dual AV node physiology. Now, again, we know that dual AV node physiology can go with uh, AV node reentry tachycardia. But again, it's important to recognize that a lot of healthy, normal patients who do not have AVNRT do have evidence for dual AV node physiology. So this is important evidence for us in trying to figure out what the patient may have as a mechanism for SVT but it does not definitively mean that the patient has AV nodal reentry, but we're gonna keep this in our mind's eye as we continue the EP study. So the next thing that we typically do is a so-called atrial extra stimulus testing. And this is just a very standard approach that we do in every patient who's having an EP study where um, the uh, atrium or the ventricle, in this case, we're doing atrial extra stimulus testing, is paced at a certain rate, in this case, at uh, cycling 500 or a rate of 120 beats per minute. And uh, it's paced for eight beats at a rate of uh, 120 beats per minute or cycling 500. And then one extra beat, or what we refer to as S2, is placed uh, at an earlier and early cycling. So again, when we're doing extra stimulus testing, the standard approach, which is done in every laboratory in the world, is that you pace eight beats at a certain rate, and then you put in an extra stimulus. And you do this over and over again. And each time that you repeat the set, the stimulus, you lower the extra stimulus, in this case, 420 by 10 milliseconds in order to see what happens to conduction. So when we put in, we do 500, 420, the AH interval is 121 milliseconds. And then we go 500, 410, and we see that the AH interval has gone from 120 to 135 milliseconds. Now, normal AV nodes will decrement, meaning that the, we talked about this a moment ago, that the AH interval will lengthen by up to 50 milliseconds for every 10 millisecond drop in an extra stimulus. If we observe a greater than, 10 mil, than 50 millisecond increase in the AH interval with a 10 millisecond decrement in S2, we consider that as also evidence for dual AV nodal physiology. So let's see what happens in this patient. We would expect that we will see duals because we just demonstrated sustained slow pathway with rapid atrial pacing, but Sometimes the patient's heart doesn't read the textbook. So we are now at 500, 410, and the AH lengthens by 15 milliseconds. And then at 500, 400, uh, we see that the AH interval has lengthened quite substantially. So again, we were at 135 milliseconds for the AH with an extra stimulus of 410. When we went to 400, we jumped by over 100 milliseconds um, in the uh, AH interval. So this would be an example of, um, dual, of a jump of 135 milliseconds to 286 milliseconds, and this would be also consistent with the diagnosis of dual AV nodal physiology. So now we have two pieces of evidence uh, in regards to possible mechanism for SVT, dual AV nodal physiology. And please stop me at any time if uh, you're having difficulty uh, understanding uh, anything that I'm saying here. Okay. okay. So uh, we now have two forms of evidence for dual avionic physiology. We have demonstrated sustained slow pathway conduction and an AH jump with extra stimulus testing in the atrium. So again, Dual AV node physiology may be a normal finding in patients, or it may be uh, a mechanism for SVT in some patients. So where we do not yet have a diagnosis in this patient, but we are starting to have some suspicions at least. So now the next thing that we'll typically do in an EP study is we'll do ventricular extra stimulus testing, which is exactly the same thing, except that we're now doing the stimulation in the ventricle instead of the atrium. And so in this case, we're pacing at, a, again, a cycle length 500, and we're putting in a single extra stimulus or S2. And you can see here, it's labeled at the bottom of the tracing S1 and S2. And so when we pace the ventricle, we see that there is, this, these are the, uh, the wide complex of the pacing uh, QRS. And then you can see this is simultaneous with the ventricular electrogram. 
in the uh, his and in the uh, coronary sinus and in the ventricle all the way back here. And then we see a VA or ventriculoatrial conduction. And the earliest atrial electrogram is clearly in the his. And then we see that as we move farther and farther lateral, these atrial electrogram in the coronary sinus are slightly later and later, which, and so we would call this, uh, sometimes this is referred to as concentric ventriculoatrial conduction, meaning that it's going up the, uh, going up midline through the his Purkinje system with the earliest A being in the his. Now, it's also possible that we could be going up an accessory pathway that is immediately adjacent to the his. And so at this point with just one extra stim, we don't really know if we're going up a pathway that happens to be sitting on the his or if we're going up uh, the AV node. So we then go to, uh, so again, this is the V, we measure the ventriculoatrial interval, just like we were measuring the AH interval going antegrade, we're measuring the VA interval going retrograde. So in this case, it's 136 milliseconds. So then we go to uh, 450. So we drop by 20 milliseconds because we were trying to uh, catch up in time. And we see that we're the, a, the VA interval has lengthened ever so slightly again. And again, just like antegrade uh, AV nodal conduction can decrement, decrement so too can uh, AV nodal conduction decrement in reverse. So now when we get to 430, we see that the VA interval is lengthening still to 155 milliseconds. And still the earliest retrograde atrial electrogram seems to be in the his, uh, the his catheter. So um, we know that accessory pathways, generally speaking, do not decrement, but AV nodes do. So the fact that we are seeing an earliest uh, atrial electrogram in the his, the fact that the VA interval is lengthening as our S2 gets more and more premature, suggests that we are going retrograde through the AV node and not through an accessory pathway. And then finally, when we do 500 420, we have a ventricular extra stim, here's the S2, but there is no A afterwards. And then there's a sinus beat immediately after. So this is what we would call the ventriculoatrial effective refractory period, meaning that the AV node cannot conduct retrograde uh, faster than uh, an extra stim of 420 milliseconds or the VA, ventriculoatrial effective refractory period. So here, we're, uh, at this point, the next step that we chose to do was to V-pace and give 12 milligrams of IV adenosine. And so I'm gonna ask uh, Dave Barris, what do you think is going on in this tracing, Dave? Uh, this is while the patient is being V-paced and is given a dose of 12 milligrams of adenosine. So um, going from left to right, um, you can see that um, initially there's a uh, ventricular um, stem followed by um, atrial depolarization, still earliest in the his. But then as we go to the right side of the screen, um, we see that there is the um, ventricular depolarization, but there's a VA block. That's right. So you don't see any. So just as David said, the VA interval actually seems to be getting ever so a little bit longer, right? If we compare the interval from this V to this A compared to this V to this A, I think you would agree that this looks a little bit longer. And then this VA interval looks even a little longer still than this one. Certainly it's longer than this one. And then as David appropriately and correctly stated, here are two ventricular complexes, paste complexes with no retrograde A at all. So what we're seeing here is ventriculoatrial block with uh, IV adenosine. And uh, Dave, uh, what would this suggest to you in regards to the presence or absence of an accessory pathway? So I would say this shows absence of the pathway because we're blocking through the AV node and, they're, and we're still not having any um, VA conduction. That's right, because uh, and another way of saying that is that accessory pathways, generally speaking, are not adenosine sensitive. And so the fact that we see VA block, which we know will happen in the AV node, um, suggests that there is no other mechanism for ventriculoatrial conduction other than the AV node. So it sort of is a good way of additionally proving the absence 
of uh, an accessory pathway. Okay, but we still at this point have not yet induced SVT. So we have some evidence to suggest that there is not an accessory pathway. We have some evidence to suggest that there's dual AV node physiology. So we would, we're now starting to think more and more that this could be AVNRT, but we really don't have SVT. And so we gave the patient isoprel. And in fact, uh, we were able to induce this. Uh, very easily with atrial extra stimulus at 500 to 40, we got this tachycardia. And uh, I just wanna see what I wrote here. What we see here is that the VA interval is essentially zero. So what we see here, let's just look at the QRS. So we, in our mind's eye, we work our way down. So everything that's simultaneous with the QRS is gonna be a ventricular electrogram. But if you remember in the CS before, there was an A and a V, quite clear. But here there's only one signal and that's because the A and the V are occurring almost simultaneously. Um, and so they are superimposed on each other. We know that if it, there is a signal that is simultaneous with the QRS, it has to be a ventricular electrogram. But because we don't see any other atrial electrograms, we know that the V and the A are on top of one another. And so the VA interval is essentially zero. It might even be negative. We see here that the A in the high right atrium is a little bit after the onset of the A in the uh, His, but even in the His, we see a His, nice big His bundle, um, a V and an A superimposed, and a nice long AH interval with a normal HV interval. So uh, when the VA interval is less than 70 milliseconds, we've talked in the past that that is generally uh, not consistent with the presence of an accessory pathway. So um, at this point, uh, Josie is measuring the his to his interval, uh, which is 292 milliseconds. So that's the tachycardia cycle length. So a little, a little above 200 beats per minute. And again, this is on isoprol. Um, and then we place a PVC at exactly the moment that the his bundle fires. Now we've talked about this uh, on a prior uh, EP conference, how a his refractory PVC means that when you're pacing the ventricle and you can see the QRS complex is different on this one beat versus all the others. If we put the uh, PVC at exactly the time that the his bundle has fired, the only way for the, eight, for the ventricular impulse to go up to the atrium from this PVC would be through an accessory pathway because if the his bundle has just fired, it will be refractory. And that means that if we're looking at the atrial depolarization, if there were an accessory pathway and we put a PVC when the His bundle was refractory, meaning when it exactly depolarized, the next day would be early because the pathway would allow VA conduction because it wouldn't matter if the His bundle was refractory because the pathway would not be refractory. However, if there is no accessory pathway, then when you put a PVC in at exactly the moment that the His bundle is fired, there is no way for that impulse to go from V to A any earlier than normal because the gate is shut temporarily because of His refractoriness. And so we put the PVC in at precisely the moment that the His has fired or what's referred to as His refractoriness. And when we measure the next A, we see that it is exactly on time the same 292 milliseconds that the his to his interval is, the A to A interval is. And so, in other words, if we were to describe what we just saw, a his refractory PVC did not advance the next atrial electrogram. It was in fact on time. Again, his refractory PVC does not advance the atrial electrogram. So now, what are the data that we have collected? We have the AV conduction is decremental and concentric, meaning it's going earliest through the bundle of His and later and later Vs as we go more and more farther from the His bundle. VA conduction is decremental and concentric. There was dual AV node physiology present as demonstrated by sustained slow pathway conduction with rapid atrial pacing as well as an AH jump with atrial extra stimulus testing. We have VA block with V pacing and 12 milligrams of IV adenosine, which is often suggestive, as David said, of not having an accessory pathway. 
The VA interval is short, well below 70 milliseconds. And the earliest retrograde atrial electrogram is in the, pair, the His pairs. And then finally, a His refractory PVC does not advance the atrial electrogram. And so all of that together makes us have a diagnosis of AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. And that is how we came to this uh, diagnosis. And uh, as you can see, we had to use a number of different pacing maneuvers in order to really cinch this down. And why is this important? You could have argued that we didn't need all of this evidence, that we could have just used the first two or three and surmised that this was likely the cause. That's true, but you know, as you know, when we do an AV node modification, we are by definition burning close to the AV node in the bundle of His. And so particularly in young people, we want to be as certain as we can be that when we're going to start taking risks in burning near people's AV or freezing near people's AV nodes, we better be darn sure that we're, we have the correct diagnosis. And the data that we've collected through this uh, half hour of discussion, I think, pretty clearly cinches down the diagnosis of AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. And so that's really all I wanted to discuss today to go through some of the basics of how we come to do EP studies and think about making diagnoses in the cath lab before we go ahead and do an ablation. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? Okay, we've got silence in the, in the room. All right, uh, I think with that, we'll stop for the day. I'll just tell you, we proceeded with the slow pathway modification. We proved that the patient was no longer inducible on isopril as was easily inducible before. AV conduction was normal, AH and HV were all exactly the same. And uh, the patient went home a couple of hours later. All right, I think with that, we'll stop. I uh, hope everybody has a great day. See you in, uh, in sign out just in a short while. Take care everybody.